What does it mean to be an ordinary hero? Is it to go against all you have known to advocate and fight for the rights of others, or is it to live a life of servitude? For Joan Trumpower Mahalan, that is who she is. Despite her upbringing as a white woman and being disowned by her family, she became the first white woman to attend Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. Hi, I'm Morgan Othamit, and I'm happy you could join us for a Cool Talk conversation. Today we are speaking with civil rights activist and freedom writer, Joan Mulholland. How did your faith influence your view on racism? In Sunday school, we always learned Bible verses every week. They were things like, do unto others as you had had them do unto you, love thy neighbor as thyself. And I could see that in the South, we weren't doing that. We weren't treating people the way we wanted to be treated. And I felt that was wrong. And I wanted to do what I could to make the South, I didn't care about them Yankees, but I wanted to make the South the best it could be for everybody here. How did you find time to participate in sit-ins as a working college student? As a college student, I mean, we did it, um, well, we cut some classes, but um, I was at Duke University in North Carolina, and my roommate, fortunately, was into this, too. So when the students who were organizing and doing the sit-ins and picketing came and invited us to join them at a sort of a semi-secret um, youth fellowship meeting one Sunday evening, we just went, and I got arrested. And we were planning another demonstration, and I told one, my English professor, well, now, who I knew was sympathetic. Now, sir, um, they're planning a demonstration when I have your next class, just before that. And if I'm in jail and you give one of your pop quizzes that you're famous for, can I make it up when I get out? And he laughed and said, oh, no, I'll bring it down to the jail cell because you can't cheat in there. So that was when you were at Duke University? Duke was ballistic. And I dropped out after I finished my semester and got my credit hours, I split. Did you find that most of your friends were unsupportive or did you spend most of your time with those who had similar beliefs? I was from a very transient area in Virginia. So you lost your friends. My Duke roommate who had been in the sit-ins in Durham, she and I are still friends out at Tougaloo College. That was civil rights central. Everybody was supporting you. In fact, when people got out of jail, the chapel bells would ring and everybody would flock over to the chapel to welcome them home. And, and I'm still in touch with some people and go to my class reunions and things. When you decided to enroll at Tougaloo, were they hesitant to admit you? They were very supportive. Um, I had the idea when I, I'd seen the riots with Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes in Georgia. Uh, when they tried, when they integrated under court order to state university, I thought this is not integration. Just a couple black students at a time. Because you didn't say black back then. That was rude. Colored students. If integration is real, it's got to be a two-way street. And I talked it over with my friends and SNCC um, at the next at the fall meeting. The consensus was that's a good idea. And somebody said, well, if you're going to do it, you may as well go to Mississippi because those students haven't done anything yet and had any sit-ins. So I applied to Tougaloo. And my high school uh, back here in Virginia, just point blank, very nasty over the phone, refused to send my transcripts. But um, Duke Tougaloo said, well, we'll accept you on your Duke transcripts. They understood what was going on. And the next co connection I had with my old high school was about five years ago. I was asked to be a com the commencement speaker. And now it's the most diverse school in the entire United States. And I brought up sending my transcripts to the principal from the stage, but they still haven't been sent. I guess if I wanted to pay money, they would dig them out and send them. And I'm not paying. I mean, it, the procedures were followed at the time. It's on their dime now. So they were really mad at you? Oh, yes. But now they're proud of me. What a difference 50-some years makes, huh? 
How did your parents think about your participation in the sit-ins? What did they say? Now, my mama was from rural Georgia, which is sort of like rural Mississippi. And she grew up with the believing segregation was, was the norm. It was the way things should be. The church, the law, the society all taught that. So she was horrified. And, she, you know, it was so embarrassing. What could she tell her friends and family? Mm. And so she, she was really freaked out. Daddy was from a small town in Iowa, southwest Iowa. He was not prejudiced. But he was a little concerned that his little girl might get, you know, her head beat in. Understand that whenever you were preparing for a sit-in or organized demonstration, you had to be careful about where you went because you could get others in trouble. How did you navigate that? Being white, I did not, you know, go walking down the street with black folks. We would go discreetly separately and then join up at, at the demonstration. I could get them really, in, you know, hurt if we went together. But I could use this being white, you know, to my advantage. I could get, um, I could just sort of blend in with the crowd and observe a demonstration that was going on. That's what I was doing the day of that sit-in in Jackson, Mississippi, where I got all that sugar dumped on my head. The, the picket line got arrested right away, so the other white person I was with, she was out at Tougaloo also, she worked there, we decided to go on down to Woolworths and see um, what was happening because we hadn't seen any squad cars or paddy wagons going down there. And when we got there, that's just when all, pardon the French, hell was breaking loose. And um, this ex-cop um, was had pulled Memphis Norman off his stool and was kicking him in the head and everything. He was bleeding out of his nose, his ears, all that. He had headaches for the rest of his life. Oh, and that picture um, of us at the counter with me getting all that sugar dumped on my head, you know, like I wasn't sweet enough already, that is the most integrated sit-in that took place. John Salter, who looks pretty white, was a Native American tribal member, but his mama was of European ancestry. And then you have Ann Moody. And if you haven't read her book, Coming of Age in Mississippi, you should. How did you handle conflict from strangers, like when they poured sugar on your head or called you names? Nonviolently. You just ignored them. Now, you see, our big mistake, we had finished our exams at Tougaloo. Good time to go demonstrate. What we didn't realize was it was exam week at Central High School. And the seniors, if their grades were good enough, they could leave school and come up to North Capitol Street and get something to eat, but they couldn't get their lunch off campus because the counter was closed with us sitting there and they were not happy. So, you know, one would do this and you know how some of those high school boys are, the girls, of course, we aren't that way, but the boys, one would call us something unpleasant, the next one would try to outdo them and call us something worse. One would dump sugar on us. The next one would get ketchup. And they even got down to spray paint. They were trashing the store trying to find things to get us with. And it finally got closed. Did the police show up during that demonstration? The police were outside laughing. You see, the Supreme Court had ruled like the week before that demonstrating was freedom of speech. And the police could only come in if the store was closed and the demonstrators refused to leave. Then the manager could invite the police in, ask them to come in and get us out of there, make a rest. The police thought this was so funny. They couldn't do anything about this near riot going on inside because of the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court decision came from a consolidation of cases, just like Brown versus Board put several cases together. And I was involved in two of those cases that led to the decision. In Glen Echo, Maryland, which was an amusement park before they got into these big six flags and what have you, it was a local amusement park. I had gone in and bought tickets because I had always gone there as a kid. Every summer it was the big treat. 
I had gone in and bought tickets. You had to have a ticket for each ride you were on. And I got the handful of tickets and went back out and handed them out to the black students and a couple of white ones with them who got arrested sitting on the merry-go-round with their ticket in hand. So I was involved in two of the cases that led to the Supreme Court decision that kept the cops from coming in to Woolworths and Jackson. A little irony there. Which demonstration were you arrested at? I had been arrested in Durham twice, just sitting at the counter. The police would come in and get you. And I had been um, arrested in Baltimore, Maryland at a sit-in with the students there. The DC sit-in group worked together with the um, Baltimore group and I got arrested up there too. So they arrested you twice? Well, I was arrested twice in Durham, once in Maryland. Well, I was arrested on the Freedom Rides in Jackson. We gathered in the post office in Jackson, which is a federal building. And then we went outside and had a, a prayer session on the steps because of some other arrest. And um, I had even called the Department, U.S. Department of Justice when I was back up here in, you know, Northern Virginia and asked about jurisdiction. And I was told that only if the police, local police were in hot pursuit, they had to be, you know, running you down, could they arrest you on federal property? But that didn't matter to the Jackson police. They, they just arrested us anyway up there. Never mind the federal law. <laughs> I think eventually the charges were dropped on that one, but um, the police ignored the law. Which demonstration caused you to be sent to parchment? That was the Freedom Rides. The jail in Jackson, the white women's cell, it kept getting fuller and fuller. And in the white women's cell, of course the jails were segregated, there were so many of us that we had less than three square feet. Think three square feet, how big that is. Less than three square feet per prisoner for sleeping. Unless a couple of us got under the bunks at night. One girl slept curled up in the dripping shower stall, but it was way too crowded and more people were still coming. So they moved us up to Parchment. Now, they did it to try to intimidate us, but I'm a Southerner, I knew their game. They were just trying to frighten us, but it was really roomier and cleaner, and the food was just so much better than it had been in that county jail. Do you think your generation was the most forward thinking back then? Heavens no, just a few of us were crazy. How different do you think this generation is from your generation? Your generation is carrying the revolution forward, as they say. Um, to see the Black Lives Matter marches are so big and so diverse. I mean, we had a few Asians, a few Hispanics and, and with us back then, but basically it was, you know, the black students and a sprinkling of white but now it's everybody's out there together. Do you think we've made progress? I'd like to say my generation took care of legal segregation, legal under the law, but now your generation has to take care of the continuing discrimination. And we see so many more types of discrimination on lang native language, you know, spoken at home, religion, uh, what sort of food you eat, disabilities can people can be prejudiced on that so many more forms of discrimination we we recognize and call out now and i think that's real progress to close why do you think it is important to vote you should vote because you have a voice you determine the future with your vote and so many people were killed particularly in mississippi for you to have the right to vote. Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, I knew two of them. Medgar Evers, Vernon Damer, no doubt others. For people were jailed and sometimes killed for the right to vote. 
So you, you need to honor their memory. And you need to have a say. If you don't, if you don't vote, you can't complain. To learn more, visit the Joan Trumpower Mulholland Foundation's website. There you can find educational resources, the Uncomfortable Truth podcast, as well as the documentaries An Ordinary Hero, The Uncomfortable Truth, and After Selma, directed by Loki Mulholland, Joan's son. You can also donate to the cause.